Let's stand together and let's worship our King.
the reason why we have gathered here this morning and to declare before you and before all of our family and friends here that you are the way that you are the truth and that you are the life that we continue to come back to your well to be filled up to be strengthened to be encouraged Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for offering us eternal life through your salvation. And it is in you that we put our trust. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Canby Four Square Church this morning. And if it's your first time, we hope especially that you feel welcomed and that you feel the love of the Father here this morning with you. And I also want to say a happy Mother's Day to all of us in here where that resonates. And I just came back in the country. I've been visiting um, Southeast Asia. I was in Malaysia for 10 days. And it was a really incredible trip. And it's a Muslim country. And that's the first time I was really in a country where that was the predominant uh, people group and where Islam was practiced. And um, it was really lovely, actually, to observe the people on their turf, on their terms. And one thing that I've been walking away with is how the language of love is universal. And another thing that I've been thinking about is how the presence of light and the presence of darkness is a real thing. And that is something we can engage with even in our country here. But the presence of light and the presence of darkness And Jesus came, and when he came, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the light of this world. I am the light. And I believe that light is through his compassion and through his love and through his salvation for all. Amen? So as we continue in worship this morning... I wonder what it would be like for all of us just to kind of reflect on that, that he is the light, that he is the one that goes before us, that he is the one when we are in a dark chapter, that he wants to come and sit and abide there and just shine his presence of comfort there. Because it's in him that we abide. So let's continue in worship.
the world you step down into darkness opened my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you so here I to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me
You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Let's sing that again. You give light. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart.
my strength, my soul, this cornerstone, this solid ground, and firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my holy Lord. Thanks to worship team. Man, thank you so much. Well, happy Mother's Day. We honor all of you who are moms. And my own mom watches this service in Denver from video. So happy Mother's Day to my mom. And uh, 88 now and going strong. Just we honor you. Uh, we have peppermint, uh, uh, pat peppermint patties uh, afterwards. And they're, they're um, beyond my favorite, although I do need a Snickers from time to time. But peppermint patties, I understand they're Annette Swore's favorite, so they're available to all the ladies afterwards. We just want to honor moms. But we know it, Mother's Day isn't always easy. Some have uh, lost a mom and there's grief. Uh, some haven't known their mom, uh, raised in the foster care system, or maybe mom was abusive. Some want to be a mom and have not, hasn't happened. And for some, being a mom has been really tough, a wayward child, a child that's passed on. It can be hard. In the midst of it all, Jesus walks with us. Let's pray. We want to pray a blessing on all our moms. God, we just thank you for our moms, for the generosity, the selflessness that we have learned from them. And for those that struggle with this day, we ask for 
comfort, and we are aware that you walk step by step with us uh, through whatever valley, whatever mountaintop. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your just enormous love for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So glad all of you are here. Those of you who are new with us, just make yourself at home. Just so glad that you're here. Um, we want to go ahead and receive the uh, giving, and if the ushers want to come forward, in Rooted, we talk about the verse, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And we realize that we are simply managers of God's money. We don't own any. Now, I've kind of described myself as frugal over the years, and actually that can be a synonym for stingy, though we'll not talk about that this morning. But what happens when we're frugal or stingy is it shuts off that generosity that allows us to be givers and to really care. And I think naturally we want to be generous. We want to be like Jesus. And so I, I just encourage us to reclaim that space of being a manager of what is God's and then be able to be more free in our generosity. And thank you for the generosity that, that you have. God, we just thank you for the faithful giving that happens here. And God, we just pray that it would be a reflection of your generosity. We just want to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the men's retreat is just one week away, and we anticipate that the theme, what if, is going to open up a lot of dialogue about possibilities in men's lives. We are on target to see guys changed, make friends, and carry it on from there into their um, lifestyle. And so if, you're, if you haven't signed up yet, guys, you can sign up after this in the lobby, or you can sign up online. We love you, we wanna see you there. Well, let's watch the video. Hey, welcome to church. Happy Mother's Day, moms. We are so glad that you're with us. We even have a little um, gift we wanna give you on the way out the door. Uh, we we wanna just invite everybody to have a great time today. If you're new or visiting, we're glad to have you. We wanna give you a free copy, so fill out one of those connect cards. You can take it to the bistro behind the counter. They'll give you one. Uh, we just love to just treat you. And uh, again, want everyone to know that Annette and I and about 30 to 40 of us are off in Israel right now today. We're celebrating Mo uh, Mother's Day in Israel. So we just want to thank you for uh, being here this morning. Hey everybody, it's that time of year. VBS is right around the corner. It's coming next month in June. So you can go online, cami4square.com slash kids, and you can sign up to volunteer as an adult. We'd love to have you. We just need all the help we can get. And of course, sign up the kids. We want as many kids here to just have a blast, fill the week. Uh, our campus comes alive when our community kids show up. Hope you're, hope you're there. Hope to see you there. Hey, just to give you a heads up, we've got youth camp coming up, junior high and high school camp. It's going to be happening soon. You can go to northpacificcamp.com, sign up there. We want to see you. Come on out. It's life-changing. I know camp for me as a kid was life-changing, uh, did radical things for me. So we know that's true with our kids. So we're praying, and we want to sign up. Sign up as soon as you can. Hey, if you want to know any more about Canby Foursquare, Hey, just go online, candyforsport.com. A lot of events, a lot of things happening, so you can check the calendar there. We also want to remind you immediately after the service, we're going to have prayer teams all around the building. If you need someone to pray with you, spend time with you, talk with you, please, please uh, go spend time with uh, our care team. They're great and amazing. So God bless you. Hey, friends, welcome to church. So glad to have you guys here. Happy Mother's Day. I'm James. I get the privilege of serving on staff as one of the pastors here at Canby Four Square Church. What I do is I'm the dean of Canby Bible College. So we have our very own two-year biblical higher education institute. We equip students to love and lead like Jesus. We've got an opportunity quickly for you. Summer prayer retreat, Friday, Saturday, June 28, 29. We'll be down at Mount Angel Abbey under Kristen Cheney's uh, wonderful guidance. She's a spiritual life director here or spiritual life professor for us at CBC. And it's a chance for anybody to be able to get the experience and the tools 
to have a more enriched and meaningful prayer life. Really encourage you to check it out. It'll be a transformational time. Go online, canbebiblecollege.org. And of course, as you heard, uh, Pastor Ron and Annette send their greetings. They're in Israel having a blast, if Facebook is telling the truth, um, which of course it always does. Um, and also, moms, um, thank you so much for the contributions that you make to your families, to this church body, to our community. Uh, my own wife this morning was awakened at like 3 a.m. to take care of a sick child. There are hours of unseen, untold, unheralded, self-sacrificial service that mothers have put in. So moms, thank you. My desire for you this afternoon is that it's filled with mimosas and naps. I like that as well. All right, uh, so you're going to get me for the next two weeks, this week and next. Um, we're going to do a little two-part series. Today, we are going to be discussing godly living in a political age. So we're going to be discussing Trump, border security, gun control, climate change. No, no, sorry. It's a terrible idea. I know what you're thinking. You're like, James, it's Mother's Day. I brought guests. Why are you doing this? No, we're not going to talk about those things. We are, however, going to talk about how we talk about those things. So that's today. Then next week, assuming there's anybody left in the church after today, um, come back. We're going to be talking about godly living in a technological age, asking the questions around how our devices are shaping our view of ourselves, of others, and of Christ. So that's what we're going to be doing over the next couple of days. Godly living in a political age. If you know me much, you know that I like to try to condense the entire sermon into a single sentence. We call it a sermon in a nutshell. It answers the question, what did we talk about at church today? And today's, your answer is, the goal is to be invited back to the conversation. The goal is to be invited back to the conversation. Um, in the year of our Lord, 2019, you may have noticed that the conversations that you're in with friends, family members, coworkers, strangers in the coffee shop, sometimes it feels like when you're in that conversation, you're actually in the middle of a dark forest with cougars and landmines, and you're not sure if the next step that you take is going to be the one that blows up in your face, and you've lost a friend, you've made an enemy, and you've created a whole mess. It's no secret that we are living in an increasingly political and polarizing age in which the conversations that we have are more fraught, are more dangerous, or simply not happening at all for fear that we step on a landmine. So, for the sake of our witness in the world, for the sake of the reputation of the church in our community, for the sake of glory of God in the world around us, I care very deeply that we become equipped with something like a biblical strategy for talking about difficult, political, polarizing issues in such a way that doesn't create trauma and havoc. Now, we probably won't succeed this morning, but we are going to give it a try. And so if you're a little nervous about what's about to happen next, join the club, so am I. We need to pray, and then we'll get into it. Uh, Jesus, help me to speak truthfully, kindly, graciously. Lord, help our words as a community, especially to those lords who don't agree with, agree with us on political issues. Be ones that are marked and seasoned with generosity, with grace, with empathy, with humility. Lord, we need you. Lord, if there's anything that I'm about to say that is incorrect or untrue, please spare these people and correct me. God, we need you and we love you this morning. Would you be alongside us? In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, today, if you have a Bible, you're going to be opening it up, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to get there, where we're going to be. We're going to get there in just a moment. Uh, but today, the key question that we're going to be asking ourselves is how can we talk about contentious issues without losing our witness? How do we talk about contentious issues without losing our witness? See, here's the thing about contentious issues is that they develop tribes. A, a, a contentious issue is anything around which a tribe has developed an opinion. And here's what I mean by a tribe. A tribe is a really useful tool for a lot of us because when you're inside of a tribe, you share a common purpose and you share a common identity. You answer the question, do people like me do things like this? And you ask the tribe and then you fall in line. 
This becomes really useful for us. And it also becomes really useful because it doesn't mean we have to think as hard because there are certain kind of keepers of the flame in each tribal group, people for whom, whose opinions and research and facts we trust and we wait more than others. And so what they say on a given matter is going to mean a lot from us. It keeps us from having to do a lot of the original research ourselves, which frankly, given how much is out there in the world, is really handy. However, tribes begin to break down here, because in a side of a tribe, they're very good at defining what is right and what is wrong, who is in and who is out, who is to be accepted and approved, and who is to be rejected and shunned. And so when a contentious issue arises, the tribe will develop an opinion or the truth about that particular thing. And anybody who does not ascribe to that particular version of the truth is seen as an out-group member. It's a them, it's a they. It's those people over there, and those people over there are, are enemies to be debated and defeated, or idiots to be exposed and embarrassed. And when tribes begin to communicate to each other inside their tribal categories, then what we get is tribal warfare. Um... There are many contentious, contentious issues in the world today, um, and if you, you probably won't be surprised to know that I, I built a spreadsheet and categorized them <laughs> by topic. Um, gender and sexuality are some of the areas in which you're bound to get into trouble very quickly. And for a long time, you might be thinking, well, like the LGBTQ community, that's something for like, you know, godless and, and urban Portland to have to deal with. Down here in rural and conservative can be, we don't have to think as much or as hard about those kind of things. And yet recently, there was an issue that was brought forward by a city councilwoman here in Canby of a transgender day of recognition. It was put forward to the mayor, and this was simply something to acknowledge the presence of the transgender community here in Canby and to provide a sense of welcome and safety from the political leaders at the city. The mayor declined to sign it. Now, as you may imagine, in an issue like this, what happened next was that the tribes took their positions around the issues and began fighting it out, especially inside of the Facebook, mess the Facebook community groups that are present. And if you, were, if you began to observe some of those conversations, you found that very quickly they devolved into insult slinging, name calling, and just a general dumpster fire. It was a really sad, and I don't think anybody won on any side. I don't think anybody's minds were profoundly changed. In fact, I think most of the negative stereotypes we have about other people were more or less confirmed. I had coffee with that city councilwoman who brought that proposition forward recently, and we were chatting about this thing, and I asked her how her perspective of the faith community had changed in light of what she saw in the aftermath of that whole fiasco. She looked at me sad, and she said, James, it was so sad to me. Not only the divisiveness and the division, but there were members of the transgender community who messaged me watching this whole thing unfold online, and they told me I have never felt less safe in my own town of Canby, Oregon, and I've now never felt more likely to want to commit suicide than I do in watching this whole thing unfold. When we're dealing with issues related to the LGBTQ community, invariably these are things that strike deeply at a sense of personhood it's very very vulnerable it's very emotional and so how we behave inside of those conversations has tremendous power for pain and tremendous power for restoration and if there's anything that might trump if you will that particular issue it's issues related to politics and regardless of whatever you might feel about the current president and his administration and policies chances are you've come close to either losing a friend or straining a relationship regarding your opinion of the president and just let me give you a pro tip here if you're looking to save some money this holiday season here's what i want you to do at the next family gathering go up to somebody in a different generational bracket than you older or younger doesn't matter and just offer them your unsolicited opinion on any one of these issues I guarantee there will be fewer people in your life who want to hear from you come the holiday season. You'll save a ton in Christmas presents. Politics is more, has, has probably, well, I, t I take that back. We went to war at one point over a political issue, so I don't want to say it's the worst it's ever been. But the politics that we engage in now and the conversations around them, it's no secret, are incredibly polarized, are incredibly political, are incredibly divisive in which we tend to, from inside of our group, look at others outside of the group, and we label and we diminish them, and we, in and, and large parts, condemn them out of hand. So there are many contentious issues that we're facing in the world today. And I talk to a lot of you who are saying, I'm just not having these conversations anymore. There's like a whole set of agendas that we've just kind of agreed to not bring up anymore as a family. 
And know what, that, while that may be a short-term solution to keep a superficial peace, what we haven't done is we haven't done the, the intellectually and emotionally honest work of challenging our own thinking, of asking questions of the other, of trying to learn from one another. And so again, for the sake of what we're trying to do here as Christians, exemplifying a Christ-like and biblical understanding of what it means to be a citizen in today's world, I feel like we need to press into rather than withdraw from issues related to this. And to do so, we're going to lean on Paul in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, as it turns out, is the 12th chapter in the book. And that's actually important because there's 11 previous chapters that are going to go on. You know me, I'm a huge fan of context. So if you'll forgive me, I'm going to take the following four to five minutes. I'm going to, I teach the class on Romans at Canby Bible College. So 45 hours of lecture, I'm now going to attempt to contract to the following four minutes. Please don't take notes, we'll move too quickly, buckle up. Book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul in AD 57 to house churches that were assembled in Rome. These churches were comprised of both Jewish and non-Jewish people. They all loved Jesus, had great faith, but they were struggling to get along with each other because of the racial and ethnic differences that separated them. So Paul writes this letter to say, you are unified in the gospel. That's the big theme evidenced by his thesis statement in Romans 1, 16 and 17, which says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith through faith, for as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's a quotation from Habakkuk 2.4. Paul's pulling the Old Testament into the New to show that God's means of salvation has always and forever been faith, not works, not law-keeping, not anything else. Then, in the next couple of chapters, the end of one, all of two, the first half of three, Paul lays out a tightly knit legal argument showing that Jews and Gentiles alike stand condemned before God and without hope. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And into that place of hopelessness and despair, Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, but now God sent his son in the flesh to be a propitiation for our sins. Heavy theological language. The upshot is, is that God does through Jesus what we could not do for ourselves, namely to bring us back into a restored relationship in which we are now justified and the sins we have committed have been set aside by the work of Christ on the cross that we now access through faith. And guess what? Romans chapter 4, this has been the same since Abraham because Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. Paul quotes that in Romans chapter 4 to demonstrate that God's means of salvation has always been accessed through faith and we are all now children of Abraham recipients of the promises given to him not because we're Jewish and follow dietary laws circumcision and law keeping but because we have the same faith as Abraham and these redound to benefits of justification that's Romans chapter 5 they are we have peace with God we have access into the grace of his presence and we have the Holy Spirit who pours the love of God into our hearts because why Romans 5 8 God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were still sinners Christ died for us when you hated God he loved you first and he went and got you. And that love is so strong that even when you keep sinning as a Christian, God's love super abounds and covers your sin, which raises an interesting question. Well, why don't I just keep on sinning if God's grace is going to keep on covering? That's Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means, Paul yells back at you. And here's why. Because you've died with Christ to the power of sin. So through your baptism, you went into the baptismal waters like Christ went into the grave, and you came out of them like Christ came out of the grave. Now, and animated by the Holy Spirit, where now the power, the jurisdiction, and the authority of sin is broken in your life. So Romans chapter 6, verse 10, no longer consider yourselves as slaves to sin, but as slaves to God in Christ Jesus. So the power of sin is broken in our lives. What about the condemning power of the law? That's Romans chapter 7. Same reason. No, the condemning power of the law is broken in your life because you have died with Christ, and now you've been raised again to new life in the Spirit, Romans chapter 8, to be animated by the Spirit, to love God, serve others, take care of creation, and know that you are finally and forever and fully loved because Romans 8, 38, I think it is, is that there's neither height nor depth, angels nor demons, principalities nor powers. There's nothing in the earth, on the earth, or under the earth that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Boom. Then it's chapter 9. Don't give up. I'm still going, okay? <laughs> Romans 9, 10, and 11 is one tightly knit argument about this question. If everything that we saw in Romans 1 through 8 is true, then what happened to God's promises he made the Israelites in the Old Testament? And this is Paul's thesis. He says, God has not failed his people, and he has not failed his promises. And so the Israelites will finally and fully be saved, just as the Gentiles will. Remember, unity through the gospel for both Jew and Greek. 
And then all of that redounds to, in the end of chapter 11, this beautiful soliloquy of praise as Paul realizes that he serves a great and magisterial God who loves you. And then Romans chapter 12, where we are now, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, the therefore refers back to everything we just talked about, about how God found you when you hated him, how he saved you and adopted you as a son when you did not deserve it, who had given you everything. He's broken the power of sin. He's broken the condemning power of the law. He set you free through life in the spirit. And now he's going to set you out knowing truly, finally, and forever you will be saved through him, what are you supposed to do? Beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable worship. Ha! The only logical thing to do in light of God's grace towards you is daily, lovingly, self-sacrificially giving yourself up for the glory of God and the good of others. And that is the context by which we find ourselves now in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. You want to do that yourself, take my class at CBC next spring. Okay, so everything in Paul's world about who Christ is and our response to it is summarized in that top line, let love be genuine. And then everything else that he's about to say is a modifier that defines and expands upon what genuine love looks like. Does that make sense? So there's one heading, and we're going to look at about 20 different modifiers that all describe and explain what genuine love looks looks like. The very first thing that Paul says about genuine love is that you have to hate. That's strange, but notice what we're supposed to hate. Hate that which is evil. So when the church stands up for those oppressive systems, many of which are political, that strip power away from those who are powerless, that take a voice away from those who are voiceless, that do not stand in the gap for injustice, then we are not abiding by what genuine love is because we have not yet hated what is evil. And so the church is to be an advocate for and a faithful and consistent presence within those who cannot speak for themselves. We are to hold fast to what is good. Romans 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Here's how I love this. Okay, I have a brother myself and I have three sons. I know a touch about brotherhood. Here's the thing I've learned about brothers over the years is that they just don't go away. Here's the thing. When brothers fight, they don't get the luxury of never seeing each other again. You have to keep living with these people. And what we've somehow figured out is through the advent of the internet is that we've been able to now take our online interactions and we've been able to treat now people as anonymous and disposable. We don't have to live with these people anymore. We don't even have to know their name or see them. And we can now be looser with our words because the impact of them we'll never know And the Bible calls us back to a very local, very familial, very centralized sense of, I want you to engage every relationship you have as though this is a family member that you cannot shake. This is someone that you must see again. This is someone for whom you have to continue to be in relationship with. And so oftentimes, the tribal systems that we're a part of, they they encourage us to treat the other as an enemy to be dismissed as an opponent to be defeated, rather than a brother to be lived alongside of. And if we allow the political systems that we align ourselves to or the tribes that we identify with to strip away from the other a common set of humanity as people who are dignified as image bearers of God, who are worthy of honor and respect simply because they are, irregardless of whatever political positions they hold, then what we've done in that moment, if we allow that, is that we've essentially made an idol out of our tribal identity. And we've sacrificed our highest and holiest calling as citizens of the kingdom of God to mere republicanism or democratism or whatever else. And one of the things that I really care so deeply in the course of this whole thing is that one, we acknowledge and identify our own tribal thinking because all of us are products of the systems in which we are raised up in. And yet, We acknowledge them and we can take a step outside of them to say, look, I might identify with a particular political party that has its pros and cons, that has its enemies and allies, and yet my highest allegiance is first to the kingdom of God because therein lies my hope. And in fact, I'm going to outdo one another in showing honor. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that love keeps no record of wrong. Paul says here in Romans chapter 12 that the records that you should keep should show that you're the one who's doing more to honor and respect 
others. Okay, well, how do you honor someone whose political opinions you find ridiculous, stupid, or downright un-American? You, you listen, actually, to them. And this is the challenge that we often face, is that if tribal thinking will lull us into thinking that we are right and they are wrong 100% of the time. And so there's very little room for nuance and there's very little room for mutual learning. But if we begin to develop a sense of curiosity in which we lead with questions rather than statements, in which we're genuinely able to listen without judgment to the positions of another, even if we know, already know that we're not going to agree with them, then what you've done is you've honored that person. Well, they haven't done it back to me. Guess what, good Christian? Outdo. Outdo. Don't let somebody else's misbehavior towards you give you an excuse to then treat the other person poorly. Okay? We as Christians, pro tip here, guys, just make sure you know what you're signing up for. We're following the Prince of Peace who was led like a lamb to the slaughter and he opened not his mouth. He was rebuked, he was abused, he was manipulated, and he was ultimately bodily destroyed, and yet he did not rise up in defense against himself. Why? Because he trusted his body and his soul and his reputation to God above. Friends, we serve a, a king who rules through weakness, not through strength. And if we insist on being right and being seen as being right, we abandon the way of the cross. And we sacrifice a long-term vict long victory for a short-term gain. Do not be slothful in zeal, but rather be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. The way that you serve the Lord is by every day not growing weary and doing good. Every day showing up faithfully, openly, curiously, humbly into the world around you to be able to say, my job here is to serve. And by serving my fellow man, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to rejoice in hope. I'm going to be patient in tribulation. I'm going to be constant in prayer. Here's the reason you can rejoice in hope. Because, good Christian, you belong to the kingdom of God. And that is your primary identity. If you're already stressed about the outcome of the 2020 election, thinking that this is a key thing and my sense of hope is rooted in making sure that my political leader of choice gets into office, then that's a good signal to us that we've misplaced where our true hope must lie. Friends, our God is a lot bigger than a Republican or Democratic Party. Our God is a lot bigger than the United States of America. Our God's objectives are much larger than the things that we often concern ourselves with. And I want to be the kind of person that's aligned primarily to God's agenda, not a political party agenda. Because if my hope is placed there, then I have, mis then I have essentially, I'm worshiping and serving a human ruler rather than the one true divine one, someone who God puts on the throne. So, our hope is built in Christ. We read the end of the book. We recognize that he's sovereign, and he's turning all of history towards his ends. But the people that I like the most aren't in power. That's fine, actually, because guess what? It gives you the opportunity to joyfully, faithfully, lovingly express your work in the world. So be patient in tribulation. In this process, you will, be, um, you will be abused, you will be misunderstood, you'll be intentionally miscommunicated about. And guess what you get to do? You get to be patient. You get to be patient. Why? Because you trust that your reputation is held in the hands of God. You trust that your identity is rooted and grounded in Christ. You can be constant in prayer. If you're going to gossip about someone, if you're going to, um, if you find yourself in that kind of mental conversational loop in your own head about that person and you just wish that you had the courage to actually tell them what it is that you're thinking, that's a good clue that you should, one of the ways to stop that, to interrupt that loop, is to start praying for them. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. I'm convinced that hospitality is the future of mission in 2019 and beyond, and here's why. Whenever they go out and they ask people, non-Christians, non-church people, what do you think about Christians, and especially what do you think about white evangelical people, the two things that always come to the top of the list in the surveys are Christians are anti-gay and anti-science. <laughs> Congratulations, friends, that's our reputation. How are we going to undo the damage that's already been done on that front? Well, let's go inside our tribes and just get in this massive echo chamber and then yell loudly and hope somebody on the outside's impressed and then joins us. May, no, mm, maybe not. What if instead we said, what happens is that stereotypes and caricature begin to develop. 
and if you think about this, if you, and because why? Because we're really good at reducing people to labels. And so if I'm over here in my tribe, then everybody else out there is a them. They're a Democrat, let's say. Well, Democrats are this way, and they're all this way, and they all believe these things. Well, but the person that you're actually pointing to is, is a person. Oh, they have a name, and they have a story. They have a series of experiences and influence and thought leaders that are involved in their life to make them who they are. I wonder if rather than just trying to be content ourselves with labeling the other person, we actually invited them out for a coffee, for a lunch, over for dinner, for barbecue and board games, something by which we began to see beyond the label to the person themselves. And guess what? Guess what they have a chance to do? Because you know what they're doing? They're labeling you as well. Oh, they're a Christian. They hate gay people. Oh, well, what if you, through the course of faithful, remember, being invited back to the conversation, were able then to undo in their minds that sense of Christians are always and only this way. Hospitality gives us the avenue into people's lives by which we share a common meal. We focus on the things that bind us rather than the things that divide us. And in so doing, we have an opportunity to first demonstrate and show Christ's love before we're able to tell it. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Well, guess what, James? I invited somebody who I don't agree with out to coffee and they said no, or they said I was an idiot. <laughs> uh, this will likely happen and you need to prepare yourself for this potential. And here's what I want you to do. I don't want you then to devolve into confirming that all people who don't agree with you are this way and then giving up hope and getting cynical. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to bless is to take the responsibility that you have to, like Christ, actively seek the good of the other who doesn't believe like you. To bless and do not curse them. In so doing, if we fall into those very common, very natural defensive traps, then the polarization and the politicization of those issues only begin to get further and further apart. And we do damage to the ability for, uh, for the witness of the gospel because there's no, there's no more ability to have any sort of conversation. I want you to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You're developing the qualities of empathy that is the emotional capacity to feel what the other person might be feeling. You may not agree with them. You may not actually think that what they think is actually entirely dangerous, but unless you can, unless you can empathize with why they are the way they are or the set of experiences that has allowed them to come to that direction, then it'll be very difficult to be engaged in a meaningful and present conversation in which you don't have any expectations of them nor they of you. So rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Great advice, almost impossible to do, but here's Paul's indication for how you can do it better. By living in harmony with one another, the thing you have to do is you have to cast down pride. So in addition to developing the quality of empathy, now we're after humility. And in humility, what we do is we associate with the lowly, people who aren't our equals, people who don't think like us. And in fact, you never be wise in your own sight. One of the great traps that we fall into with tribal thinking is that all the thinking is done, and there's no more learning to be had, and there's nothing more that we can do here. Guess what? You can learn anything from anyone if you're humble enough and you're curious enough. And in that, you, get, you receive a gift if you allow yourself to, and friends, please don't be afraid of ideas that are not your own. It is the mark of an intelligent and mature mind to be able to examine an idea fully and then put it down again. You do not have to be scared of things that you don't immediately agree with. You can examine them, and then you do the intellectually honest work, and then you can still say, okay, I, st I was talking with um, Gary Brashears, who's 40 years at Western Seminary, professor of theology, one of the smartest men I've ever met. And he says, whenever I get involved in a conversation with uh, a Muslim or a modern secularist or anybody else who I know I don't agree with, I said, I am fully convinced in my own mind, he says, that Jesus is the, only, that Jesus is the best answer to all of the facts. However, in that conversation, I have to be willing to jettison Christianity if I feel like it's not the best answer for all of the facts. That intellectually honest work makes him able to be compassionate and empathetic in that situation. Now, he's convinced, and he's not jettisoned Christianity, he's a faithful proclaimer of the truth, but that ability to say, I'm willing to, I'm willing to learn from someone who I don't agree with gives you that invitation back 
into the conversation. Last couple of things. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. When we hop online and we adopt the posture of a keyboard warrior who wants to pastor the internet or police the internet, and just there's someone who's wrong on the internet and I'm going to fix it. Okay? This is a self-defeating mechanism. It's, a, it's, just, it's just online spaces, unfortunately, have just not been the fruitful places by which meaningful, thoughtful conversations exist. So, so have them, just have them in person. And when people come back to you with all sorts of vitriol and hate and frustration, it's playground ethics, it's what I tell my boys, just because he hit you first doesn't give you the res- right or the responsibility to hit him back. Do what is honorable in the sight of all. And then lastly this, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. I love this about Paul because he's such a realist. He's like, live peaceably with everybody. Except it's not possible sometimes. And so far as it depends upon you means that sometimes it depends upon other people and sometimes other people are jerks. So we need to modulate our expectations to know that basically what this means is the question that you need to ask yourself is, is my side of the street clean? And it doesn't matter that your neighbor is throwing trash at you. You don't get to throw trash back. Keep your side of the street clean. Pro tip, you're going to stand before God one day. You're going to give an example or you're going to give an account for everything that you do and say, not what other people have done and said to you. They've got to give their own account. But you only get to talk about what you did, not what other people did to you. So don't fall into the trap of seeking vengeance Don't fall into the trap of trying to protect your own. Don't fall into the trap of needing to be made right. It's a losing battle. Because the goal of all of this is to be invited back to a conversation. And a conversation is different than a fight. It's different than a debate. But one of the ways that we can heal a very fractured and divisive land is by acknowledging our own political preferences and leanings and then being actively empathetic and curious to go outside of our tribal lines to be able to introduce ourselves to other people and have a conversation and then behave in such a way inside that conversation that a second one can follow. And here's the reason why, friends. Think about your deeply held political beliefs. Chances are no one is going to be able to dissuade you of those in the space of one single conversation. So guess what? You're not going to do that for anyone else either. If you really want to change, if you really want to see people shift in the way that they think and feel, it's a long-term process in which they're consistently exposed to a loving presence that they feel trusted, that they feel embraced, and that they feel welcomed. And so if we develop the, the qualities that Paul lists here of tremendous empathy, of tremendous humility, of good curiosity, then we can be that kind of conversation starter that moves us forward. We have to reframe what winning looks like. So often we adopt the language of a culture war, and we are soldiers in it, advancing ground and defeating the enemies around us. Friends, as long as we think of people at the end of our guns, we will never love them or argue them into the kingdom of God. But if we can recognize that they simply are human beings made in the image of God, loved and redeemed, loved and able to be redeemed no matter what, then there's a possibility of a relationship there can have, that God can use for redemptive ends. Let's finish with a few suggested action steps. Here we go. First thing I want you to do, just resist outrage. So common. The internet has made us outrageous, meaning that we are very quick to see something that happens, whatever the thing that Nancy Pelosi or Donald Trump said, and then boom, everybody takes up their... It's just, it's difficult to be able to find any sort of equilibrium emotionally anymore around those kind of things. Now, there is a place for righteous anger. You see it all the time in Jesus and Scripture. He's constantly going after those oppressive systems that keep people back from experiencing the fullness of a life in God, all right? But that's a very big difference than righteous outrage, which is immediate, which is emotional, which is reactionary. So if you find yourself getting, what is the parlance, triggered, pause. The Benjamin Franklin thing will come in handy. Count to 100 and then say or do your next thing. Resist outrage. Show hospitality. Uh, Buy a Traeger. Invite people over. Something to embrace people into your home. There's a reason that we as human beings, we're all social creatures. And we share a meal, there's a bond that gets formed. And so if you can, be a kind of presence in the lives of people who don't agree with you such that if you invited them over for a board game night, for a barbecue, for a cup of coffee sometime, they might even be curious to hang out with you and spend more time with you. 
What are you going to do when you get inside of this conversation? What is there to talk about with somebody whose political views are very contrary to your own? Chances are you actually know less than you think about other people's political views. Why? Because echo chambers exist inside tribes, and we spend most of our time there. So you're going to have to develop the qualities of curiosity. And this is great. You go into a conversation like a learner, not a teacher. And so you might say some things like, I know we don't agree on like marginal tax rates or what we should do about, you know, student income debt or income inequality or the transgender community. Just help me understand how you see this issue. And then stop and shut your mouth and listen without judgment. And what you might find is that people are interested. They'll, they'll clarify their own thinking in the process and you might end up learning something. And then potentially the most controversial thing that I've ever said on the stage <clears throat> Stop watching cable news. Um, here's, here's the reason. The reason I don't watch cable news is that I have three boys, and so there's always enough juvenile yelling in my house to fill it up. I don't need the television to provide any more for me. Let's be honest. Inside of our tribes, especially if you lean more conservative or Republican, you're, you're probably leaning towards Fox News to see a lot of where you're going to get your information. If you lean a little bit more um, Democratic or liberal, you're probably going to be more fascinated with CNN or MSNBC. Okay? All of these platforms are primarily commercial enterprises in which they sell advertising against viewership. How do you keep viewership? Primarily by appealing to your base, by either stoking fear or creating outrage. Neither of those things are conducive to good citizenship in which you actually understand the issues at hand. Instead, it devolves into just people yelling and shouting at each other, okay? So here's my encouragement to you. Take a seven-day hiatus. Take the time that you would have spent watching evening cable television and do something else. But then pay attention to yourself as you go through it because chances are watch any news channel for any length of time and then take your pulse feel your blood pressure, feel the things that you're thinking, feel how like tense and stressed you are, that's on purpose, friends, and it's shortening your lives and it's making you a worse person. Like, so take a little break and see how you feel. Now, you still need to be an informed citizen, so what should you do? I'm, belaying, I'm betraying my millennial status by saying this, but, but read paper. Okay? If there's a big issue now, there'll be a big issue at the end of the month. So get a, a reputable, high-quality monthly news magazine. In fact, get two. One whose tribe kind of agrees with, and one your tribe does not agree with. Why? Because the next time you show hospitality, you'll actually have the talking points of the other person that you can show curiosity for, and the conversation is lubricated a little bit more. So yes, stay informed, but let's acknowledge that cable news is probably not the best medium to create the kind of humble, empathetic, um, open-minded, curious people that we want to be if we want to ever get invited back to the conversation. This is a deeply difficult, um, nuanced issue, and I don't know if I've done a great job helping you see it, but I, I, I care so deeply that we point ourselves back towards the truths of Scripture and the standards of behavior that are given to us as followers of Christ. And if we find ourselves allowing the political issues that so animate us to then mute and diminish our witness as Christians, then it's a signal to us that we're putting our hope in the wrong place. And so my encouragement to you is that as you go out into this world, that you develop the relationships such that there's a conversation that can get started and even more importantly, one that can get scheduled at the end of the first one, and so on. And in so doing, what we do is we'll be a people who reflect the love, grace, humility, empathy, curiosity, and kindness of our Lord in a very difficult and contentious age. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, help us. Um, we've done some damage as Christians um, to your name and to the sake of Christ in the world in the way that we've behaved and so, Lord, we just want to just own that and, and repent and ask for your help and, and, and being a kind of people who are able to follow a prince of peace. So, Lord, help us to resist and reject tribal warfare. Help us to be more, to own our own opinions deeply, but, then, but also to hold them with an open hand as we are able to listen to the voices around us. God, give us discernment, give us nuance, give us thoughtfulness, give us courage and boldness to be ambassadors of salt and light in this world. We love you a lot, Jesus. We need you so much. Help us. In your name we pray. Amen.